they send me screenshots or I can be DM'd or they'll just kind of tag me under things, you know. Um, and they were like, well, look at this. This guy's Israeli. Well, this guy is like clearly, and he was literally just like screenshotted or caught talking to his like fellow, fellow tribesmen, um, you know, basically saying like, oh, you know, we have to find a way basically, you know, if, if God wills it type thing, we, we have to, like, we have to show this. I.e. he had a kind of personal motivation to show his own group as being superior. He, I mean, literally just a kind of racial supremacist for his own people. This is what, well, this is what he was doing. Bla like he was blatantly doing that. Um, and so it's like, well, okay, yeah, he's doing science, but he's also like partial and therefore, you know, he had a kind of vested interest to try to, uh, debunk the, my, my de debunk, which, um, I still, for the record, think stands. Um, oh yeah. I've some yet... of those studies had a sample size in the single digits. Oh, I mean, re re like, but also you, you read it down. Oh, we took uh, six year olds. Six, I mean, IQ tests from six-year-olds from the 70s, and you're going to aggregate that data, and you're going to say, oh, well, this this stands in for, you know, so many millions of people. Or yeah, one, nine seven-year-olds in the 70s, yeah. Or, or the one the one that Dutton sent me, which, which again, was poor. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ed, it just was. Um, where they, they had taken samples, right, from... Uh, lots of different religious groups. This is the most recent one, and you have a look at the end num the end number, the actual sample. And again, it was like sixty Anglicans, sixty Jewish guys, one thousand Catholics. Oh, right, the Catholics had a way lower score than like those thousand Catholics had a way lower average well, than the sixty people that you did there. Because that's fair. Real... That's fair representative, isn't it? You know. I said that level four is a good example that there are very few truly heterodox issues and framings, and that a lot of the human biodiversity stuff is just really easily observable reality. People from the Indian subcontinent, sub Saharan Africa, and South Asia in general are lower intelligence, noticeably to even like the average person. You can just tell these people do not function on the same level that Europeans do. You, you can just tell that intuitively. And it's very don't believe your lying eyes. And it's the intellectualization of the normal kind of pattern recognition that people have of just like, these people aren't intelligent. These people don't know how to deal with modern civilization. It's that stuff. That stuff is not controversial. And the fact that it is controversial is a great sign of liberal hegemony. And all this stuff is being brought back into the conversation slowly because it's just reality. But it is it is the one issue. There's the it seems in many of these cases there is only one issue. And it, it's it's a real good way of preserving political energy in that you can talk about all of this. Free speech is a huge, huge establishment talking point from from the from the, the rightward arm, as it were, because it's useless. It creates this endless conversation, it creates all this noise, it creates all these people are all, you know, on various ways, almost all of them are extremely pro-free speech because they want to have the endless conversation. And as I said earlier, as long as you're talking and as long as there's this fever pitch conversation going on with all these disparate noises, all these different voices drowning each other out, then it all just ends up in stalemate. It's all just the same kind of blob that we've seen before of just political talking heads. And I don't know, I, I, I suppose... I, do we want to talk about mole bug? What, what's why, yeah. why? Why is Mr. Yarvin here? There's a few people well, who've been worried about this. So, 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 so if you have a look at my thing on the on the on the right here, in the final analysis, all of these groups, all of these people in the deep cover part, work to justify the rule of one particular group over others, right? And there's many other people you could, you could add in here. You can think of your own examples, right? But in one way or the other they show or they they justify um the uh a small ruling elite right having hegemony over everybody else uh with yarvin i'm always reminded of the essay he wrote on the uh the elves and the, the hobbits the elves and the hobbits yes the elves and the hobbits um now with peter P peter thiel uh, a lot of this you see 
one of the realizations for me uh, was actually after October the 7th happened, which is that why has all this intellectual energy been spent to get everybody to accept illiberal ideas? Illiberal ideas, right? The post-liberalism that we're talking about. Why is there an effort to get people to accept that? And if you have a look at what Yarvin wrote after 10 seven in many ways he just put it more bluntly than than everyone else he said listen just don't worry about this let them uh let them just get on with it basically just let them wipe it just let them do the genocide because that's how things have been sorted out before and frankly in our post-liberal reactionary elitist kind of worldview what's it to you anyway we've already moved beyond past all those liberal priors so a lot of, so, so so the dawning realization really is that a lot of this you know react kind of reactionary thought was actually to mentally prepare some people for that basically to just get them to accept that <laughs> the, that makes sense um the, the liberal frame is being dispensed with on the left in quotes it has already been dispensed with this is one of the things we talked about when we went over the nudge unit stuff and a lot of the kind of behavioral psychology unit a lot of the government nudge unit stuff is predicated on the idea that liberalism is a farce and that people need to be controlled and they talk about it in veiled terms but increasingly they talk about it openly it's very clear that the ideology of someone like the nudge unit and someone like the Tony Blair Institute, who use a lot of the same kind of psychological tools, does not believe in the liberal frame and is outside of the liberal frame. It has transcended it. It doesn't buy into its own bullshit. It does not sniff its own farts. And so you can see, I, I quite like Curtis Yarvin. I think he is earnest in many ways, but he cannot see outside himself. He is a San Francisco tribesman. He is a floppy-haired looking wine ant. He is somebody who does not have will to power. He is not somebody who is extremely hard edged in the ways that people thought he was in 2013. He is a coastal Jew. And because of that, he can only see inside that frame. I believe he's earnest in his belief, and I believe he's created a lot of good work, but he also likes to play nice with people, as everybody does, as you do. And course, the problem sir. is... If you play nice with people, if you accept a penny here, a penny there, if you accept an interview here, an interview there, it's very easy for a containment structure to be built around you. It's very easy for someone to basically sneak up behind you and plug a cable into you and plug you into the rest of the machine. And what happens is with ideas like, you know, mole bugs ideas, is that the soft edge of them gets absorbed. The soft version gets absorbed. I remember Newsweek talking about the cathedral, but talking about the neutral cathedral in the things just happen. You know, this was all created by accident and there's, there's no purpose behind it. And that version of managerialism, of the accidental view of history creating managerialism, is completely defanged. But it, it's it's able to be put out there. And I, I, I feel that Curtis Sharpen is somebody who is earnest. I think he's somebody who is relatively honest. But I think he's somebody who has essentially had a giant structure built around him to feed off his political energy. And that happened mm -hmm. to you, you during the election, I think, in that you had a lot of the from oh. UK's campaign based on certain on mutations of things that you were saying. And you're not somebody who is going to wave a Nigel Farage flag. You don't believe reform is a populist party is going to believe we're going to save the UK. You author the populist delusion, for God's sake. <laughs> and yet yeah. zero yeah. seats can become an electoral well, slogan for voting for a populist party. Is, because see, they can take your political energy and they can harness it. The, the, now, now my, my criticism of these level four guys could also be leveled at me to some extent as well. Because elite theory, specifically, um, and the sort of stuff that Yarvin talks about as well, because, and because a lot of it is in the kind of neutral value, it's a kind of toolkit, it's an analytical toolkit, okay? It's kind. It's not difficult to use that to look at the system, and to do a kind of uh, systems analysis, a kind of um, a debugging. You know, what do you? I mean, you're you're an engineer, Scrum. What do you call it when you look at the way a machine is working and see all its errors, see like where uh, the bottlenecks the, are? And... They're doing the equivalent of like political process engineering. They're looking at like a manufacturing process, which is how I view managerialism. I see it as a giant machine. 
and yes. thinking of it in machine terms is the only way to understand it. So, they are so looking these guys, at the, yeah, the process and trying to refine it. They're doing what Thatcher did in that they're saying they don't want to destroy the managerial machine. They want a more efficient machine. They yeah, want they a want more efficient the, nightmare machine. They want the machine to work better. And I, I, <laughs> yes. I would say all four of these guys that I pictured here, the, 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 the Creamu, uh, Lovecraft, Thiel, and Yarvin, want the machine to be fully operational. Because at the moment it's it's half cocked. It's got problems. It's got DEI. It's got you know shit livery. It's got you know it's got all of these kind of meddlesome problems to do with democracy and liberalism in and around it. Um, wouldn't it be better if it um, you know if the if the machine could work with executive monarchical power in the same way I've talked about how Blair and Starmer and you've talked about this as well, Scrum. Blair and Starmer getting the UK machine up and running. All systems are go, fully operational Death Star. Um, essentially, you can see Yarvin, Thiel, and so on as working in the same way. Basically, to just kind of, am I wrong? No, no, they're, they're looking for, no, you're completely right. What they are is FDR Americanism. They are that confluence. They're looking back to what worked in managerial history and what worked with modern technological societies. And they're going, ah, well, there was this confluence in, you know, the 30s and 40s of FDR, Stalin and Hitler, basically, of the big, you know, the big mass harness managerialists of grabbing the reins of the mass and moving them. But, but what all of these people don't understand is that the political moment has gone. And that you can't become FDR. You can't strip out the bullshit because the bullshit was put in place to shore up the machine. The bullshit is like a prop. Imagine this thing is crumbling and they're putting props in. One of them's like, you know, the woke conversation to keep people engaged, DEI to integrate all these immigrants they've had to bring in and give them some sense of meaning and make them think they've got a slice of the pie. All these things were done, not for ideological, but practical reasons. And they mm. think that you can just put back the clock and in many ways go back to the command economy of like an FDR, that if only we could FDRify everything, if only the government could properly take the limiters off, take off all this ideological bullshit and just become the managerial iron fist, just harness the mass. But they're wrong. The techno-globalists are wrong. Uh, all of these people do not understand entropy. They don't understand the TED pill. They don't understand the lull. They don't know that managerial society and modern society is entropic, that it eats itself, that it's still consuming the remnants of the old world. And when it is done with them, it will fall down and die because of nothing else to eat. I want to be fair to Yarvin a little bit because <clears throat> I think Yarvin would agree he'd co-sign a lot of what you just said. You know, remember, he is the person who coined Cthulhu always swims left. You know, he did talk about entro entropy and so on. He, and in fairness I, I, to him, in fairness, in fairness to Yarvin, I'm just trying to kind of like steel man Yarvin a little bit here. I mean, that maybe it's because I've met him. I feel kind of a oh no, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm defending not, not, Yarvin too here, really, not not, not to kind of bear, bear, bury any of these people. I, and I, in fact, we'll come back to Harrington because uh, there's a there's a little bit that we need to mention on her as well. But with um with with, with Yarvin, he has been telling people for years. Listen, like, just forget the culture war bullshit. Clear pill yourself on all the bullshit. Don't talk about, like, um, abortion or don't try to get, like, gay little victories here and there. Don't try to use power to do this and that because you'll do it wrongly and it'll be ham-fisted. You know, when the time comes, it has to be swift. It has to be clean. It has to be, like, a, you know, a, a one step he talks about. I remember he gave a gave a talk sure, about sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, sure. So he he does kind of he does kind of get all of that, and he's got this idea that if you're swift enough and ruthless enough, you can just take out that take out that bureaucratic layer and replace it with executive power. Um, you know, under a kind of monarchical president like Trump or something. That's the basic plan. Whether that can actually happen or not. You know, I'm well. I I am doubtful, but well, uh, that's what I, he wants I'm, to do. Right? I'm not attacking Yarvin here. I'm attacking Yarvin as filtered through JD Vance. 
um and that you have somebody who can you know what i can i can i quickly read a quote here from jd vance okay because yeah, it's it's really interesting that he he's somebody who has been posited as like a yarbinite and yet you have this quote here right before the picture this quote is right before a picture of him touching the wailing wall by the way in a yamaka <laughs> but but uh to quote jd vance here um uh, if we're going to support Israel, as I think that we should, we have to articulate a reason why it's in our best interest, uh, the Republican senator continued. A big part of the reason why Americans care about Israel is because we are still the largest Christian majority country in the world.